just don't mark in your book. <laughs> Thought I'd say that. It's good to see all of you this morning. We have a number of visitors with us. We hope you'll sign one of our guest cards so we can have a record of your visit. If you have any questions about anything that's done or said or anything we stand for, don't hesitate to ask. We're open for questions and won't hurt our feelings in the least if you have a question about something. It's good to see some heavenly sunshine for a change. And we come together to sing about the heavenly son of God today. And we hope you've joined in with us and have benefited from the singing today. This morning we're talking about the question, is the church ever fully restored? And let me back up one there. That one. That's a question that we raise. Uh, sometimes there's been discussion about that. I've read several comments over the years in which some brother argues that the church is not now and never will be fully restored. There is an element of truth in this, but there's also implied something that is not true. And we want to try to sort those out this morning. The element of truth is, is this. The church is composed of human beings, none of which is perfect. So sometimes when people talk about, well, there's this going on in the church, and uh, this hypocrite and that hypocrite, we've never claimed perfection. In fact, we claim imperfection. The person that claims perfection, of course, is going against the scripture because the Bible says we've all sinned. And if we say we haven't, we not only make God a liar, we make ourselves liars too. And so the work of bringing one's life to perfection is a lifelong task that still will be incomplete when we die. And so what we're longing for is we need forgiveness. Only in that sense do we reach perfection when we receive forgiveness for our past sins. And so thinking about that causes us to raise the question to point out that none of us is perfect or ever will attain perfection. There has been one perfect person, and that's Jesus Christ. And the idea that the church is never fully restored leaves another impression that is not true, and we want to try to sort that out also. That impression is that one can never know the truth that we never can arrive at the truth. And that implies that truth is unknowable. Well, if it's unknowable, why are we wasting our time even seeking for it? Why don't we do something else? And therefore, there's a certain subjectivity, how you feel, and a relativity, nothing absolute, just kind of fuzzy and vague and foggy, that kind of an idea, uh, to every statement about truth. And yet the Bible shows that there was such a thing as truth. It could be known. It could be obeyed. And the affirmation implies that one can never know for certain about the New Testament from the New Testament church that it can never be completely restored. And there are people that feel that way about it. Our lesson today is designed to address that aspect of the study. And so as we look further, we want to remember that on the day of Pentecost when the church was established, but the Bible tells us that Peter stood up with the eleven and he began to preach. And the result of the preaching that day was that about 3,000 people who heard the gospel were told to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. And about 3,000 people did that and those who gladly received his word were baptized. So that's one of the things we learned there in Acts 2. The church was established. Peter stood up with the eleven. Another thing, and of course those people that were baptized that day, about 3,000 of them. That was the beginning of the church. And the church grew rapidly. The next chapter was over uh, 5,000. After that, the number uh, is a great multitude. So it increased rapidly. And so we notice, as look at the, look at the scriptures, that those who gladly received his word, and that word gladly is mighty important there, because it has to do with the attitude in which people received the word. People that don't gladly receive the word don't do what those people did. People that gladly receive the word do what those people did. So that's something for us to consider as well. 
But as we talk about the perfection of the church, the scriptures teach the all-sufficiency of the church, that everything that it needed, God gave it in the first century. And so the church, as planned by God and built by Christ, is a perfect church. And as a perfect church, that church has a perfect architect, a divine architect. You heard the scriptures read a few moments ago there in the book of Ephesians in chapter 3, and especially verses 10 and 11. We'll take a look at those again. To the intent that now unto the principalities and the powers and the heavenly places might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church wasn't just an accident that happened unforeseen. It was a part of the eternal purpose of God. It was in God's mind before the earth was created. And that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. Now, it's true that the, church, the work of the church is to preach the gospel. But the manifold wisdom of God here is seen in the church itself, not just the work that it does, but that it was something divine in the mind of God which showed his wisdom from before the foundation of the world. And so it says to make all men see that fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Christ Jesus to the intent that now, now unto the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. It is something that can be known. It's not something fuzzy and vague or anything like that. But not only a divine architect, but also a perfect blueprint. And the church had a perfect blueprint. The author of the book of Hebrews, I believe was the apostle Paul, he said, who serve unto the example and the shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. How can you follow the pattern if you can't know it or understand it? <laughs> well, that implies we're expected to understand it. So when people say you can't understand the Bible, that's going against what the Lord said he expects of us. And so even as God had a divine pattern for the tabernacle under Moses that he built, he has a divine pattern and a blueprint for the church and is found in the New Testament. The blueprint is so clearly revealed that all churches are expected to be alike. Have you ever noticed that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17? Paul was teaching how things ought to be. He said, as I teach everywhere in every church. He teaches the same thing everywhere and in every church. And then also he says in chapter 7 and verse 17, as I teach everywhere in every church. And so ordain I in all churches. So Paul was saying he taught the same thing everywhere. He didn't teach one thing to this church and another thing to that one, to where they were all different. But the same thing was taught in all of them. And so in the first century, men thought that the divine blueprint was understandable and it could be reproduced in every local church. And that's what they did. They didn't know any better. Why can't it be that way today? Why can't we follow the divine blueprint and come up with the same thing? We have a divine architect. All we have to do is follow his blueprint. But then also we notice we have a perfect builder. The question was raised back when uh, uh, Jesus was preaching and during his personal ministry in Matthew 16. Uh, he said, who do men say that I the son of man am? And the disciples said, well, some say you're John the Baptist and some Elijah or others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But then Jesus asked the question again, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but by Father who is in heaven. Peter got it right. He said he was the son of God. Jesus was. So we have a perfect builder. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What was the rock? Not Peter. It was the confession that Peter made that Christ is the son of the living God. 
And throughout the New Testament, Jesus is called the rock. He was the stone that set it naught of you, the builders, but was the one which was needed. He became the foundation of the church. He was the stone that was set at naught, but he's the foundation. So, Christ is the Son of God. That's the foundation upon which the church is built. But also, we notice that we have a perfect head. In the first chapter of the book of Ephesians, end of the chapter, verses 22 and 23, notice what the Apostle Paul says. And he is, that's God the Father, put all things under his feet, in subjection under his feet, that's the feet of Jesus, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church is the body of Christ, and the Bible says he gave himself for the church in Ephesians chapter 5. He purchased the church with his blood according to Acts 20. And he is the head over all things to the church. If you're not in the church, then Christ is not your head. You're not in the body of the saved. It says he's the savior of the body. So that makes the church more important than men have thought that it was. Because he's the head of it. Did Christ do something in vain there? He is the reigning potentate of the, of the kingdom. But also, you notice, we have a perfect law. And in James 1, in verse 25, it's called the perfect law of liberty. The perfect law of liberty. So the word of God claims perfection for itself. The supreme head has issued a supreme law that's not to be marred by humans. We're told not to add to it, not to take away from it, but to accept it as it is, not to substitute for it. And it is described as the perfect law of liberty, James 1 and verse 25. It doesn't need emendation. It doesn't need correction. It doesn't need change or adaptation to various cultures. And in the various ages in which men live, it is always perpetually relevant. Always. It applies in all cultures. It doesn't change with the culture. And yet there are a lot of people today who are trying to say, well, uh, that was written for that culture. No, it was written for all cultures, for men. And that's why it's going to last forever. The church, as it came from the mind of God, is perfect. It's not in need of change or adaptation to, to fit the needs of men in different ages and cultures. It applies all the time. Because what has changed? Well, we've had a lot of modern inventions, but man hadn't changed. He still sins, just like he did in the Old Testament, just like he did thousands of years ago. That hadn't changed. Man is still the same. Man is still in need of a Savior. That hasn't changed. And so the same organization of the church that worked in the first century will work today. It's required today. The same acts of worship that were acceptable to God in the first century are still acceptable to God today. And the same conditions of membership in the church that were necessary in the first century are still necessary today because men still have the same problem. We have a sin problem. But then let's notice also... As we raise the question, in what areas, should have the word there, is there, is a continuing restoration needed? In what areas? Well, the idea is expressed that we're always in the process of restoring the church. And I ask with reference to what matters are we always restoring the church? And is one simply stating that imperfect Christians will always be growing and learning? If that's all we mean by that, then certainly I agree with that. No disagreement. However, we can know that we have fully and completely restored the Lord's truth with reference to his church. We can know that. Are we always in the process of restoring but never finally attaining the restoration of the identifying characteristics of the church, the things that matter? What about the truth about Jesus? What about that? Well, when we look at the book of Acts, when Peter preached that sermon, first gospel sermon preached after the resurrection of Jesus on the day of Pentecost, can we know assuredly and absolutely that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Can we know that? Or must men always live in doubt about that and be in a constant and never-ending quest to learn whether or not he is the Christ? If we're always in doubt, we can never arrive at any conclusions, can we? And so the early disciples had no doubt that Jesus was the Lord in Christ 
and the eyewitnesses were there to tell about it, and they didn't have any profit, any gain in telling that because it resulted in being persecuted. They didn't get, make lots of money for telling it because it just wasn't something people wanted to hear. And society at the lar in the large part was against them. But Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Therefore for let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, is both Lord and Christ. What does know assuredly mean? It means to believe beyond all doubt. They could know that in the first century. And about 3,000 people knew it was the truth. They knew they had crucified the Lord. Peter told them twice in that sermon, verse 23, and then here, right here in verse 36. He told them they had crucified the Lord of glory. They knew that was the truth. And they knew that he had been raised. And he appeared for 40 days on the earth to many people, to large crowds even. But then what about the conditions of salvation? Can we know assuredly what a person must do to be saved? Can we know that? Are we always in the process of restoring but never quite attaining the truth as to what we need to do to be saved? Well, or must men always live in doubt and be in a constant state of uh, never-ending quest to learn what one must do to be saved from his sins? No, we can go right to the Bible and find out what they were told to do, and the answer hasn't changed. Because we haven't changed. We still have sin. Can one know whether or not he must be baptized to be saved by the blood of Christ? Can one know that? Can he know that immersion in water is the action of baptism, not sprinkling or pouring? You can't find in the New Testament where anybody had water sprinkled on him. You can find where they were baptized. They went down into the water. And that the penitent believer is the only subject for baptism and that the purpose of water baptism is to obtain forgiveness of our sins. People were told that on the day of Pentecost, to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Well, sin is still with us today, and men still need to do that same thing in the name of Jesus Christ. The early church thought that they knew what to do to be saved, and they preached it boldly and were often punished for it by the authorities. Without certainty, they preached it to men of every nation under heaven. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized. How does he know to be baptized? It's part of preaching the gospel. Otherwise, they wouldn't have known. And so they did what Jesus told them to do. And they accomplished something that we haven't accomplished since. They were able to preach the gospel to a whole inhabited earth. Colossians 1, 23 says they did. If so be that ye continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye heard from me, which was preached in all creation under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So they accomplished that. We're still trying to do that. So men could obtain salvation and know that they had obtained it and that they were saved from sin. And we find them doing that repeatedly in the New Testament, baptizing people into Christ, into his death, which is where he shed his blood, where we contact it. Now then, we want to raise another question about the organization of the church. What about that? Are we constantly trying to figure that out, or can we know? Well, we can know how the New Testament church was organized, and when we remember that it came from a perfect divine savior, a perfect architect, a perfect plan, a perfect blueprint, then we don't have to wonder about that. And so the Bible tells us that we can know assuredly about that, or must men always be in doubt as to how the church is organized? Are we just left to figure it out? No, we're not told to figure it out. We're told what the apostles did. They thought the church could know how to be scripturally organized, and Paul and Barnabas and Silas also went about appointing elders in every church. Their qualifications are given there in 1 Timothy chapter 3. These are the kind of men that are to be selected, and we're told the, quali the qualities that they're to have, and also for deacons are told there. And so the government of the Lord's church, and it was all on a local level. There wasn't any hierarchy, pyramid structure, anything like that. They were appointed in local churches. 
And so the perfect government that the Lord commanded and ordained for his church was known and existed in the first century. And it can be known and employed in the 21st century as well. Is that too complicated to understand? I don't believe that it is. We can just simply do what they did. And we can have what they had. What about the worship of the church? In John 4 and 24, God desires those who worship in spirit and in truth. Both of those are necessary. In spirit and truth. Can we know assuredly and absolutely what is scriptural worship of the church? Or must men always live in doubt and be in a constant, never-ending quest to learn what is scriptural worship? Is there a pattern for that, or is it just uh, uh, take your pick? What you want to do? Well, a lot of churches today are organized on the basis of take your pick. But that's not the way it was in the New Testament. One thing we learned in both the Old and New Testament is that worship was not designed as entertainment. And when you look at all the regulations they had to go through in the Old Testament to offer an animal sacrifice, you know that wasn't designed as entertainment. It had a higher purpose than that. But a lot of people have stopped right there. Where's the most entertainment? That's where I want to go. I had a lady tell me a few weeks ago that she went to a particular church because it's fine. It's fine. And so do we ever have to be in doubt as to whether prayer is to be offered in the name of Jesus or in the name of Mary? We don't have to be in doubt about that. It never was offered in the name of Mary in the Bible. It was in the name of Jesus. And must we ever be in doubt about the elements of the Lord's Supper? Well, we know what Jesus took on the night in which he was betrayed and he instituted the Lord's Supper. We can know about the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Must we ever be in doubt regarding scriptural music in worship? in worship? Is it vocal or instrumental? In the Old Testament, both of them were commanded. In the New Testament, one was commanded. And it was vocal. It was singing. Because we teach and admonish and edify, we speak one to another in singing. Instruments do none of those. They don't teach, they don't admonish, they don't speak. And so Jesus, speci the apostles specified what they wanted in that regard. And it wasn't a matter of performances and uh, uh, semi-professional bands and quartets and, and all that kind of thing. That wasn't that, it wasn't designed for that. It was designed to edify, to teach. And so must we ever be in doubt as to whether to take up a collection? Did they do that in the New Testament? Yes, they did. 1 Corinthians 16, to support the Lord's work. And whether tithing is required, all that, or whether it's even scriptural to do that. Can we know? Yes, we can look in the scriptures and know. The first century church knew how to worship, and the Bible tells us they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and prayers. Acts 2 and verse 42. We learn that. They continue steadfastly in that. Well, let's notice some other things. As we notice uh, concerning the truth, whether it's knowable or not. If it's not, then we're in a hopeless situation, aren't we? If we cannot know the truth. Jesus said, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John 8 and verse 32. Jesus said we can know it. And it can result in us being free. And he apparently thought there's an absolute truth that men can know what, and that men can know what truth is. And so as we look at that, man can know absolute truth because God revealed the truth to man. And the Bible says that it's not of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter 1 and verses 20 and 21. Also in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 7 through 12, we learn more about that. And we might take a look at that. Verse 7 tells us, And the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, that perisheth, though it is proved by fire, may be found unto praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom not having seen, ye love. On whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice greatly with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, concerning which salvation the prophets sought and searched diligently. 
And then it goes on down in verse, verse uh, 12. It tells us which things angels desire to look into. So the prophets wanted to know more about it. The angels also. But he says it's now been revealed through Jesus Christ. God revealed the truth to man through Jesus Christ. But let's notice also concerning that, that men can know it. If you can know it, that implies you can understand it. Otherwise, you can't say, I know this, but I don't understand it. Well, do you really know it? <laughs> the Bible implies that we can understand it and that people can obey it. And so Paul asserted that he wrote the commandments of God, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37. The veritable word of God. Look at what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. And for this cause we also thank God without ceasing, that when you receive from us the word of the message, even the word of God, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which also worketh in you that believe. They recognized it for what it was. And we can too. And so we're told that in the scriptures. God revealed truth that the truth is understandable. Notice what he said. Wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. There's a command to understand it. So we must be able to do that. Or else he wouldn't have commanded us to do something we can't do. Also when he says in chapter 3 of Ephesians, verses 3 and 4, Paul said, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, when you read what Paul wrote, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So when we read what Paul wrote, Paul says we can understand it. Now we do know that Peter said that Paul wrote some things hard to be understood, but he didn't say you can't understand them. He just said they're hard. You've got to study harder on those. But the Bible nowhere says it can't be understood. It commands us to understand it. So as we think about that and kind of draw some conclusions here, the quest for restoration is not the aim of restorationism, but rather it's the attainment. It's the attainment of the truth that is the goal. So we're not just always in quest for it and never finding it, but it's the attainment of it. And I believe that the New Testament is that truth. It's the blueprint of which was in the mind of God in all its perfection before the foundation of the world. And it's been built and it presently exists on the earth. And so for after that, it's, it, it's an eternal kingdom that it can never be destroyed. In fact, we're told in the book of Daniel that, that this kingdom would stand forever. Daniel 2 and verse 44. Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And that we can be in that. Nicodemus was told in John chapter 3, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So... We can enter that kingdom when we're born of the Spirit and when we obey the gospel, we're baptized into Christ. And I believe that church is one that we can be members of. And the Bible says that the churches of Christ salute you. Romans 16 and verse 16. Built according to the divine pattern, composed of imperfect people in need of forgiveness, without a doubt. But it's the church built according to the pattern revealed in the New Testament. That's what we're after. And so this is the goal of the restoration movement, the effort to restore the church, the one we read about in the Bible. We can do that. And it can, can be and can be attained by all men everywhere. They can follow the same blueprint if they're willing to abide in the revelation of Jesus Christ, what he told us to do, neither adding to nor subtracting from God's divine will. So as we think about what happened on the day of Pentecost, what started on the day of Pentecost is never going to be destroyed. And those people that day, about 3,000 of them, when they heard the gospel, they gladly received it and they were baptized. What they did is what people do when they gladly receive the word. This morning, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, if you haven't repented and been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, you have a wonderful opportunity. It's a golden opportunity, one that has a limited time to it, a limited offer. We're not told when that will be over. It could be tonight. It could be tomorrow. It may not be in your lifetime. We're told to be always ready. 
This morning, if you're not ready, why not get ready? The Bible gives us all the exhortation and all the incentives we need. And what, what more could we do? How, how much do we appreciate what Christ did for us? He asked so little of us in return for what he did. If you haven't done that, will you do it today as we stand and sing the hymn that's been selected?